I need to take a moment to talk about wrapping up the story. Since January, we have been on this year-long adventure called The Story, studying our way through Scripture. Today is officially the last chapter of The Story, but we're going to do a Christmas series beginning next week that talks about God and us together in the story. So we're going to extend it a bit. But today, we wrap it up by looking at the book of Revelation. You know, what happens at the end? How does God want this kingdom thing to turn out? And I don't know anybody better to lead that in our country than Hugh Halter. Hugh spoke here a year ago. Some of you will remember he spoke during our Blessed series about how do you eat and hang out with your neighbors. I like Hugh because he's a little irreverent. He's a little bit off the beaten path. I'm not sure, but he's got some Texan in his soul somewhere, I think. But uh, Hugh leads Forge America, an organization committed to helping people to learn to live on mission where they live, work, and play. They are in 18 cities nationwide. He is uh, an amazing pastor, an amazing Christ follower. He's one of Rob Wegner's best friends and mentors. And uh, I'm becoming friends with this guy as I get to know him, and I love him immensely. He's going to talk to us about the kingdom. It's going to be great. How about a West Side welcome for Hugh Halter? Thanks, boss. Thank you. Thank you. Never had my irreverence tied to Texas before, but we'll go with it. Good morning. Nice to see you all. I am starting to feel like I'm family here. I got to know a lot of your names. Now, we a uh, little undercover thing that's been going on around here is that I, f- I come out once a month, and we've been working with a little recon group that's uh, piloting Simple Church, and the idea is really to take the kingdom of heaven, like what, what that stuff really is, and instead of waiting for people to come into a church to hear about it, we're actually going out and learning how to bring the kingdom of heaven uh, to every nook and cranny. So we got this little group that got started. Um, It's been not only fun doing that with you guys, but our family has been in the same sort of uh, scenario. I don't know if many of you have followed our story, but we've planted a couple churches in Portland, Oregon, and then Denver, Colorado. And on this last go-around, my wife and I, um, our son Ryan has had a really severe epilepsy condition, and about five years ago, he went off to this little assisted living center out in Alton, Illinois. It's a little community about seven uh, miles north of Ferguson, Missouri, where all the racial stuff's been going on. And uh, and so when we knew that he was going to leave, we decided to to just kind of chill out. Um, I resigned from our church, and we bought a little ranch because my wife has always wanted to have horses. We're like, let's just do a little bit of a rest season, and um, but we would go visit Ryan, and about a year and a half ago, we were out in Alton, and it's a very bombed out city, uh, it's average family income is about $22,000, and but we were drawn to it, never thought we'd move there, but God just totally curveballed us, so about seven months ago, we, <laughs> we sold the ranch and our, our perfect life, and we headed to this little bombed out little town, and so, uh, you know, this idea of bringing the, the kingdom of heaven to other people's, it's like right in front of our face all the time. In fact, this morning, uh, or yesterday, right as I was driving out, um, in fact, I'd taken a prayer walk. I usually do that every morning. I just kind of walk through, you know, a really bad section of town, which is two blocks from our house. And about an hour after I went through praying, uh, there was a shootout right across the street. And then I drove back through when I saw the policemen and fire engines. Some guys were just kind of doing an okay corral across the street at each other. And then yesterday, driving out, um, I was just kind of listening to music, and all of a sudden, there was a girl in the middle of the road flagging me down, and, and I didn't quite get it at first, but once I realized what was going on, it was a, it was a young prostitute, and uh, her little two-year-old daughter was actually sitting on, on the sidewalk, and she was soliciting me over, and uh, we had a little, a little conversation, but I remember just thinking, like, Alton, my, my town needs a little kingdom of heaven. <laughs> I don't know about your town. Uh, but the world needs a little bit of the way it is in this other world down in this world. Would you agree with me? So you 2 song, uh, I'm sure most of you have heard it, Bono's singing. Um, it's called Peace on Earth. It says, uh, heaven on earth, we need it now. Sick of all of this hanging around, sick of the sorrow, sick of the pain, sick of hearing again and again that there's going to be peace on earth. And then the the chorus goes up, he said, Jesus, if you take the time and throw a drowning man a line, peace on earth. We hear it every Christmas time, but hope and history, they don't rhyme, so what's it worth, this peace on earth? 
And that's really the question of the day. It's the question the world is asking uh, anybody. Um, They're even asking the church, like, you guys talk about this all the time. You talk about this other world, but when does it actually touch down on planet Earth? And it's it's the perfect thing to bring up as we talk about the, the culminating story, this final, like, final week in reading through this large story of the scriptures and what Jesus did and what it means for us, but I just kind of want to kind of throw this at you. I'm, I'm 50, I just turned 50, and I'm learning that one of the most important things about our faith that actually makes the biggest difference is what we believe about the afterlife, what we believe about the end of days. In fact, if we get the end of days wrong, most of us will live out our present days without the power and without the influence that we would normally be able to have. And so we've got to get this straight. I actually, uh, my whole idea of heaven got thrown off in eighth grade, and it kind of, it, it hurt me for a long time. It was, uh, I was actually spending the summers with my grandma Mona Mastretti, this small little Italian woman with a thick mustache, and I would spend my summers with her. I would play in these tennis tournaments out in central Oregon, and Grandma Mo lived on this old ranch. Uh, she didn't have any money, but she lived in a 13-foot travel trailer, and that's where I would live with Grandma Mo during the summers. And uh, Grandma Mo would let me do whatever I want, but Sunday nights there was a rule that I would have to come into the mobile home and we would watch the show called Lawrence Welk together. Now, <laughs> if those of you that are under 40, you're going to want to Google that, but um, <laughs> Grandma Mo thought Lawrence Welk was like a Christian show. It's a little bit like of a polka orchestra dancing thing. And, uh, and so Sunday nights would roll around and grandma would put the little, she'd fold the couch cushion down that I would sleep on, but then she'd roll it out so we could sit there together. She'd pull a little nine inch TV out of the cupboard, plug it into the little side of the mobile home, and then she would like call me over right after she would take a couple fingers and dip into this big jar of what was called menthol latum. And she'd rub her mustache with it. So now her mustache is going everywhere. And... The smell of it, uh, many of you know what that smells like, but that's, she would tuck me up under her arm, she would come here, Hugh Tom, and I'd sit with Grandma Mo, and we'd watch Lawrence Welk, and on this fateful day, Grandma Mo said, Hugh Tom, she looked at me through the mentholatum, <laughs> vapors, she said, this is what heaven's going to be like. So from 13 to about 30, I was actually honestly concerned. I did not necessarily, I wasn't looking forward to the end of days, okay? I actually was going to put my money down on purgatory. Like, let's, let's take a look at, let's like check in some of the writings on that. Maybe that would be a preferable place to go. So you can see the point. If we don't get this thing right about the end of the days, our present days are not going to be what they could be. And so we're going to actually go through some scripture. And uh, if you're following along in your your sort of handout, there's some things, places to take notes. But um, here's the big idea, okay? That in a sense, okay, the end of the story is only the beginning. Why? Because heaven is both here and now and coming completely. Many of us think that as we've thought about, you know, the end of the story, we thought it's the big payoff, Right? Some of us think it's uh, something that we're waiting around for. Some of us that it's that day that we finally get the heck out of here. But we have to rethink it. It's, it's none of those. It's, if, if we think those ways, then we do not really know what this whole thing is actually going to be like in the end. And so I want to have us read this. Um, and, and really quick, read this idea by Dallas Willard that the central message of the gospel of Jesus is not about getting into heaven after we die, but about getting into heaven before we die. Okay, so we're about to read some scripture in Revelation. I would not normally be the guy you call for the Revelation thing. That's some heavy lumber in there. Um, But we're here, and we want to just read it and see what it says to us. But remember, this is coming to a guy named John. John was one of the inner three so out of the 12 disciples, you had three guys that apparently Jesus liked better than the other ones, and we would, he'd call them in. And, and so John got to have probably quite a bit of eye contact with Jesus, like really face-to-face, some quiet conversations. And John's last memory, by the way, with all of the disciples was that night where Jesus said, I'm going to go away, 
And all of them freaked out, went, what are you talking about? And, and he would say, just relax, guys. In my father's house there are many rooms, and I will come back and get you. Uh, some of the translations uh, actually say that uh, there are many mansions. How, how many of you have heard the mansion thing? And so growing up in the suburbs, I just thought heaven was like where we all get a bigger chunk of land around our little private mansion. We get bigger homes. It's not a, a Middle Eastern concept is as your family grows, a father would just literally build on little rooms as his family. They would all live together. And so what, what Jesus was saying, guys, don't worry about it. When I come back, um, this whole frat house thing we've had going for three years, it continues. Like we will be together so that's where it ended for John. That was his last memory. And then all of a sudden, all heck broke loose. And so the disciples, one by one, began to be martyred. And John was put out on this island. He somehow escaped martyrdom for a season. He's out in this little place called Patmos. And it's, it's, uh, last night in my hotel room, the movie Castaway was on. And I was that's exactly what we're talking about, is Tom Hanks stuck on an island with this volleyball that he talks to. Um, I was flying over into the Middle East one time, and I went back to the, the back of the, where the flight attendants were and to, just to get a cup of coffee, and I asked them, like, where are we at in the journey? And they brought out this little map. They went, oh, we're right here, and I saw Patmos. I was like, oh. And so I looked out the little, you know, the little window, and I said, oh, that doesn't look real exciting. Uh, it's this little tiny place that's just this rocky scrag. There's hardly any trees on it. They, he's basically sitting out there in the middle of nowhere, and probably at this point, he's probably going through some depression, some like, is this really true? Did, does any of this mean anything? And all of a sudden, he gets these visions. So just imagine yourself how good this would have been to hear some of this. So let's just read together. He says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city of New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God and he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away, and he who was seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. A couple things you might have picked up right away, or maybe not the way that you viewed it, but I always was told that we go to heaven, right? We go to, no, <laughs> wrong, got the, apparently heaven is coming for us. Now, what's that mean? I remember a, a missiological uh, kind of leader, a guy named Daryl Guter. He's writing on the, what was called the missional church idea, and he talked about how, for most of us, um, both the church and our idea of heaven are stagnant places. So the church is where you go. It usually has brick and mortar. It doesn't move. And so oftentimes we try to get people to come to a church, and he said, we view heaven like that. that heaven's this other stagnant place, way far away that we go to. And he's like, no, and he, and he brought up the scripture that apparently heaven is on its way back to us. There's a timing issue, but God is getting ready to bring something back and is going to mingle and work its way through with what we're experiencing here. And likewise, and he said, so the church can't wait around, is that we start to work towards heaven. So both are working towards the middle, almost like the bride and the groom are trying to find each other. And I thought it was an interesting idea. I never thought about that. Another little thought that he brings up is that this heaven that God is bringing is beautifully adorned. I don't know about you, but since the Mona Mastretti moment, I did fear like heaven, maybe being boring or not that cool looking. You know, I heard about the cloud stuff, but I fly every week, so I've been above, I've seen the clouds, and it's kind of cool the first time you see it, but after a while, each, you know, you pull the shade down and you just, you know, get online. It's just not, clouds are not that big a deal. So if you ever worry about heaven just not having the allure, just remember like the, the story of what God's bringing back is really the fulfillment of where he started in the book of Genesis, where God begins to create things. And I don't know if it ever dawned on you, it, it missed me for many years, but God created the world the way he loved it. And so all the, all the different animals, all the millions of plants, um, just the way that he organized the earth with mountains and sea and rivers and oceans and lakes... You know that God loves all that stuff, cities and streets and 
fountains. It's just he loves that stuff. And then later, as, as we begin to kind of hear what he talks about in regards to what's coming, he says, look, no eye has seen. Like, so no matter if you are a lake person that loves trout or you're a beach person, how many of you are beach people? How many of you are mountain people? How many of you are golf course people? That's what I want. I, that's what, I mean, there's just, we all have kind of these loves and we've always went, man, I hope heaven's like this. Yeah, it's way beyond that. He says, no eye has, so no matter how much beauty you've seen, no eye has seen yet. No ear has heard what I am preparing to bring back to those that love me, right? Isn't that cool to hear? It's going to be that amazing. And then this last thing he says is that heaven is trustworthy and true. He probably, when he says, hey, John, write this down, it's probably because John is on his hands and knees gasping for air and just weeping because he had wanted to see something like this. He had been waiting to hear from God. And so God has to go, dude, write this down. <laughs> like tell people this is trustworthy and true. I've had some friends when we told them we were going to move from Denver, Colorado on our ranch overlooking the entire Rocky Mountains to this little beat up town called Alton, Illinois. I uh, had one of my buddies who's a pastor say, hey, what are you, an idiot? And he was serious. And I said, well, yeah, uh, Dave, I guess I am. If none of this stuff that we read about is true. Like, if this is all a big sham, then yeah, I like to like, give up all that. And like actually go try to help people and dive into poverty. Yeah, this would be the stupidest thing in the world to do. But I had to remind him, but if all the stuff that we say as pastors is actually real, if it's trustworthy and true, then what we're doing is not dumb at all. (laughs) It might be the most appropriate thing to do. I used to teach my daughter McKenna. She had some issues with fear, and I I would ask her, McKenna, do you worry about after your life? She had a very strong belief in Jesus. And so she said, no, Dad, I don't have fear about afterlife. So I said, babe, if you don't fear death, you know that you also don't have to fear living. That you can live above the fray. You can live a bigger life. You don't have to circle the wagons and try to protect everything and try to get as much as you can out of this life. You're actually now free to go crazy and to do things that maybe are more representative of the kingdom. So it helped her. It's helped me at times to remember that, that we're not crazy. People all over the centuries, still today, today somebody will die because of their faith in Jesus and they'll go, whatever, bring it. Because they believe in the story. It actually matters to them. So let's keep reading. This is now the next chapter of Revelation 22. It says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down in the middle of the great streets of the city. And on each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing... Twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are those for the healing of the nations. And no longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city. And the servants will serve Him. And they will see His face. And His name will be on their foreheads. And there will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light. And they will reign forever and ever. Let me go right to the bottom of this really quick. You know, you, you notice that you have the tree of... Life, remember where we, we find the tree? That was the no-go zone, right? That's the tree. Look, you can have anything of this paradise, but just don't eat of the tree. And all of a sudden, the tree is back. And now it's like a Willy Wonka chocolate factory. It's like it's giving out. This, it's like because there's no more curse or anything. Like that, that day is coming. Um, but it's talking about raining. Like, what's that mean? I always thought raining was that we all like, when we get up there, all the Christians get to go, hey, we win. And we put on our Burger King crown. And we just sit around and rain. But raining actually is much more, it's it's an active idea. Jesus talked about uh, the kingdom of heaven, right? The kingdom of God. The idea of a kingdom is is a realm of influence where what the king wants done gets done. That's the best way to think of a kingdom. Uh, We get a little bit of a kind of a weird picture right now. We haven't had it since 1920 where based on the election with the power of the House of Representatives and Senate and the president-elect, where we've had gridlock for all these years, no matter how you feel or if you're excited or bummed out about what's happening, something will now move. Gridlock will now be averted. And, you know, there's talk about repealing the uh, sort of the presidential orders. It's that idea that, like, when the new king, king comes in town, things do change. That's why when Jesus began to talk 
in Mark 2. He's announcing this new world. He says, hey, repent for the kingdom of heaven is now what? It's at hand. Like It's showing like a new world order is now coming into play here. Let me read from Isaiah. It's a scripture you're going to read throughout the Christmas holiday, and it references Jesus as the king of a new kingdom. Listen to this. It says, for unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end, for he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on forever. That's the story, that's a prophetic word about what will happen when Jesus comes, but Jesus specifically says it's not just about the end of our physical life. As soon as he showed up, specifically speaking about when he would take all of our sin and all of the law of Moses and stick it all on his cross and start a whole new way of living and seeing people. But it was weird. People didn't get it. Many of us, we've been in the church forever. We still don't get it. This idea of the kingdom being at hand. So as Jesus walked in Matthew 16... Uh, you remember this kind of this story where Jesus was talking about how he's going to build his church. And the guys are like, they had never even heard of this idea of church. And God's talking about like something's going to happen. He says, and so guys, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. I'm going to teach you how to live in this world. And, he's, and then he talks about the authority and the power that we would have here. He says, and so whatever you bind on earth will be bound and whatever you loose on earth will be loose. Like there's some authority, just as the Father's given me authority, he says, I'm giving that to you. So somehow in Jesus' mind, he didn't want us just thinking kingdom as afterlife. He's, you got to figure it out here. At the end of the book of John, he actually said, as the Father has bestowed upon me the kingdom, I now bestow upon you. It's a crazy idea. This is why like, even when he was teaching us simple things about the power of prayer, the Lord's Prayer, he said, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What? Like, Kingdom come, thy will be done. Where? Earth, as it is in heaven. Do you see this? And so when you think about reigning, reigning both at the end of days, even after we die, get this, it's not just that we sit around. Reigning active, it means actively participating in the ordering of creation. We get to explore, we get to shape, we get to create and contribute to the ongoing life of the new city. Dallas Willard said this, you will know fullness of function and unending creativity involved in a cosmos-wide cooperative pursuit of a created order that continuously approaches but never reaches the limitless goodness and greatness of the triune God. Powerful story. But But that's not just at the end of life. That also, maybe even more, means now we get to do this stuff. We don't just sit around and wait. We actually get after it. I'm going to read... um, some words by a New Testament theologian by the name of N.T. Wright. I just want you to get this. To me, this was so cool. He says, what you do in the Lord is not in vain. You are not oiling the wheels of a machine that are about to roll off a cliff. You are not restoring a great painting that's shortly going to be thrown into a fire. You are not planting roses in a garden that is about to be dug up for a building site. You are, strange as though it may seem, almost as hard to believe as the resurrection itself, accomplishing something that will become in due course part of God's new world order. Every act of love that you do here, every act of gratitude and kindness, every minute spent teaching a severely handicapped child to read or to walk, every act of care and nurture or of comfort or support for one's fellow human beings and for that matter, one's fellow non-human creatures, the environment, the animals. And of course, every prayer, all spirit-led teaching, every deed that spreads the gospel, builds up the church, embraces and embodies holiness rather than corruption, and makes the name of Jesus honored in the world. All of this will find its way through the resurrected power of God into the new creation. Is this making sense? There is no wasted time. God is is bringing something in the end that we will go, awesome, (laughs) way better than I ever thought, and it now means... Get to work. Everything that you do has meaning. Scriptures even talk about even the act of godliness, training your body in holiness and godliness has value for this life and the life to come. It all matters. Let me leave you with this scripture, Revelation 22 at the end. 
And now maybe this makes sense to some of us. He says, the spirit and the bride, who is that? That's God and his kingdom. The spirit and the bride, they say, come, come, guys. Come out of the pews of the church. Don't just sit around. Come, participate with me. Now, starting tomorrow, maybe today at 4.30, I'm going to need you to bring heaven here on earth. And let the ones who hear say, come. Those of us that already know Jesus, we've put our faith in him. Let us say, God, come, bring it. Bring your kingdom in fullness. We're ready for it. And let those who are thirsty, maybe some of you in here, this is new news to you. Maybe you just stumbled in today. You're still trying to figure out if Jesus is somebody you want to really bank your life on. God's saying to you, like, stop overthinking. Maybe now you see there's a much bigger picture than just going to church and trying not to sin. And maybe this would be big. Jesus is saying, come. Just come today. And all who's those who are thirsty and wish to take the free gift of the water of life, come. God, may we, as this writer says, understand the central message of the gospel of Jesus is not simply about getting into heaven after we die, but about getting into heaven before we die. May it be so. Everybody said, amen. How about a hand for Hugh? Bless you, bro. It's all about the king and the kingdom. It's all about do we love the king enough to extend his kingdom, his influence, his reign in us, through us, and beyond us. There are a lot of ways to celebrate communion today. We're going to think about communion in terms of I love the king and I want to extend his kingdom. If you're a guest with us today, you are welcome to participate in communion. It's not a church membership thing at Westside. It's a love the king and extend the kingdom thing. So we'll be passing out the bread and the juice in a moment. Hold on to it. We'll take it together. We want to give you a few moments of worship to tell the king that you love him and that you're available to extend his kingdom.
night before our king was crucified he shared the Passover meal with his disciples at the end of it he took a piece of bread and he broke it and he said this is my body it's going to be sacrificed for you do this and remember me we remember Lord Jesus the same way he took a cup and said this is my blood shed for forgiveness of sins a new covenant I make with you do this and remember we're going to encourage you to take this home with you Put it someplace where you remember. Where you're going to run into it this week. And when you do, tell the king again, I love you. And commit again to extend his kingdom. We're going to celebrate a little more. Stand to your feet. Let's worship.
Thank you, church, for how you've worshiped today. Here's my blessing to you as we go. Well, let me share one thing with you first. We have this tradition at Westside where we say, God, you've been good to us this year, and we want to give back to you. We serve a country that still has a Thanksgiving holiday. I think that's cool. So on the Sunday following Thanksgiving, we're inviting you to bring your biggest gift of the year. Just to say, Jesus, it's about you. It'll help us finish the year strong. It'll help us make up a gap we're dealing with. But more than anything, it'll help us to continue to extend the kingdom. Two weeks from today, come ready to give. May the king who we love bless us as we partner with him to extend his kingdom this week. Love you, Westside. God bless.